Welcome back to the Soar Higher Podcast, the show for leaders by leaders that provides business and career professionals advice, tools, and resources to help them achieve their next level of success. Today, we've got a really good show lined up for you. Uh, Today, we have one of my dear friends, Sean Lohman. Sean is an estate planning attorney, and he's here to share with us uh, some some different things we need to be thinking about as business leaders and how to manage our own lives, how to manage our businesses, and the benefits um, the, that he provides people just like me, just like you, that are out there in the world uh, trying to be successful, run a business, run a career, run a family in the best way possible. So without further ado, Sean, welcome to the Soar Higher podcast, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thanks for having me. Sean, uh, I've known you for for a couple of years now, and I, I just um, I just got to say, when when people think lawyers, I mean, hey, we're going to have a lawyer on the show, they're like, oh, okay, this is going to be boring, you know. They think of lawyers kind of in a stiff, stoic, you know, three piece suit kind of kind of a manner. Well, I'm telling you, folks, Sean Loman is the farthest thing from uh, uh, on a, uh, the stereotypical lawyer you would think of. He's just fun. He's he's easygoing, um, people person, and he's just such a joy to be around. Um, if he never told you a lawyer, you'd you'd wonder if he was one. But but he certainly is. He's been <laughs> one for a while, and he and he's very successful, and he helps other people uh, out there in the world be successful. So so excited to have you on the show, uh, Sean. So Sean, tell us a little bit about you, you and and your story and how you got started and and where you are. Well, I've always grown up around the law. My mom was a lawyer, my dad, my grandfather, my uncle. So, you know, every uh, every family get together, uh, people sat around the table talking about law. I mean, that's honest to goodness what uh, what growing up was like in my family. And so when I was a when I was a kid, probably around seventh or eighth grade, I started working in my dad's office. And then through high school, I got more and more involved in working in my dad's office and then went off to college and just sort of it was just sort of a natural thing to move to gravitate toward going to law school so i graduated from law school in 94 and um and i had to make a choice do i want to be a uh do what my mom does or do i want to do what my dad does and my dad was a civil trial attorney and always seemed to have more fun than my mom who did all family law so uh and divorce and uh, all that sort of stuff custody and so I, I, I went to join my dad's practice and became a civil trial lawyer. And I did that for a long time. I've been practicing for 28 years. And so I did that for, I don't know, my dad uh, retired probably about 10 plus years ago, around 10, 12 years ago. And when he retired, I was sort of um, stuck with this practice that was a big civil litigation practice. I say stuck with it, not in a bad sense, but I never really picked the type of law that I wanted to practice. So then I started having to think, is this really what I want to do? Um, Do I really want to go to court all the time? Do I want to fight for the rest of my career uh, against other lawyers, against other people? And um, and the answer was no, not really. So I, I started making a shift into a practice that I've loved doing for 28 years, and that was estate planning. I've always done it. My family's always done estate planning, but um, it was never the primary part of our practice. So I started doing more in-depth estate planning than what anybody in my family ever used to do, and, uh, and I really enjoy it. And it's very different than what I used to do. Um, but it's a it's a much more rewarding practice, in my opinion. Now, making that transition was difficult because you had this big uh, mechanism, this business that was moving forward, that did advertising, that had websites, that had staff, everything geared toward a specific area of practice and had been for decades, more decades than I'd been practicing, 30, 40 years, um, this, this law practice had been going on. And so, you know, here I am trying to change uh, direction. And it was like, you know, having a tanker 
boat going full speed in the middle of the ocean and all of a sudden you decide you want to do a you know 90 degree turn it just doesn't happen on a dime you know you have to it takes a while to make this turn and i i knew it was going to be to take a while um i don't think that i realized how challenging uh it was all going to be and um and so that's where so that's where you came in to uh, to help me in part of the situation but um but everything has had to change i mean everything we do has had to change um i think once upon a time i told you maybe this was a year or so ago that you know my dad started practicing law in the late 1960s with my mom's dad my grandfather my grandfather had been practicing law since the early 1950s mid 1950s early 1950s and so my dad learned how to practice law and run a law business from my grandfather and i learned how to learn run a law business from my dad so really i had been running a 1950s 1960s law practice um, in the 90s and 2000s and something just something had to change um, because business uh, has changed and the way you attract business has changed and um, it's it's difficult for me to even at my age you know early 50s it's difficult for me to catch up with um, with where things are so uh, yeah I mean it's 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 been rewarding it's also been challenging but you know I've had a very good legal career um, I've got four kids I was able to send them all to college and um, and pay for weddings and you know do all that sort of stuff on uh, you know in the type of law practice that I had but you know at some point I, you know I thought I've got to make a change I've got to be able to do something that I can see myself doing um, for the next 20 years. I mean, my, all of my family practiced into their 70s. My grandfather was in his 80s when he finally retired. So I'm not close to retiring. I don't want to, I don't know what I would do if I retired, but I knew that I did not want to litigate for the next, you know, 20, 25 years. Well, thank you so much for that that story, man. You, you, every time I talk to you, I just learn new things about you and your story. You got such a great family and history and background. And, you know, I just want to highlight to people how difficult it is to turn this type of practice in a different direction. That was very bold and very brave of you to do that. A lot of people couldn't do that. They struggled to do that. And you decided, you know, you, you had a, a, a rich, you know, decades, decades of family yeah. history doing certain types of law practices. And then you decided to turn and go a completely different way and rebrand yourself. You have to first undo all of the things because there's an association, you know, Loman Law equals X, Y, and Z types of law services. And that's, that's what they right. think about when they think about you and your family law practice. And so you have to unprogram people's minds about what you used to do into what you're doing now, which is specializing into certain aspects of law and, and rebrand, recondition people's. That is very, very difficult to do. By the way, you're doing a great job with it. Um, you're, you're, you're certainly doing well, um, but it takes a very specific set of, of mindset and discipline and, and things to do that. It's extremely difficult. So hats off to you there, Sean. Well, and it's hard because you have a staff as well. So yeah. if it had been just me, I think it would have been, um, it would have been e much easier. Uh, but I've got a staff who um, has done the same thing for years. I mean, my paralegal has always seen herself as a litigation paralegal. Everybody, mm. everything in my office, all the mechanisms in my office, all the client management software in my office, everything was geared toward that. And so, um, so to, to, to change this took a lot of buy-in from a lot of people. And they had to see that, oh, this is going to work. This is something that, you know, they had to see how serious I was about it. They had to see that it was going to be profitable 
because they needed to keep jobs. Mm -hmm. And so once I think they saw that, you know, all of this was starting to snowball, they, uh, they bought in and, and that's important. Now that doesn't mean that we just don't still do other types of practices of law because we right. do. And I have a law partner that handles those, but for, you know, they've seen how the, um, how this new business, uh, can work and, and, and they've bought in and, it, and that took a yeah. while. I mean, I would say it took over a year, uh, for them to buy in. Wow. Really? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's really important, you know, for folks out there that are, you know, business leaders or listen to the show, you can't just do things. You've got to think through them. You've got to, you know, bring in experts that can help you navigate these different waters that you, you may or may not have experience in, right? You never want to go out to sea without the right tools, boats, and things like that, or you, you can easily get yourself into uh, trouble. So interesting how you took your team through it over the course of time. Um, the, in the legal profession, from my background of working with a lot of different lawyers, is it is a hard organization to, to take three people through the change process. So I think that speaks to you and your leadership and your ability to, you know, be inclusive as a team leader for everybody and, and helping them be successful through that process as much as it, it is for you. Yeah, yeah. Well, Sean, let's, let's dig in a little deeper. You have decided to specialize in a particular field of law. You know, think when people think, you know, of lawyers, they, they think they can solve, you know, world hunger out there half the time. And there's just so many different aspects of law, corporate law, small business law, family law, like your mom practice, divorces and custody and DUIs, there's criminal law. There's a ton of different aspects of law that, yeah. that you could do, but you chose estate planning specifically. So tell us a lot of people don't really understand what that they've heard the word they have a general kind of idea what that may be but e even me you know heck i'm almost 50 years old and until about six months ago i really truly didn't understand what that was help us understand that sean well you know a, a true estate plan um is created when you sit down with somebody who focuses in this area of the law and you open you open yourselves to them let them know what you have what your assets are what your family situation is your dynamics so that you can walk through the process of what would happen to you if something or what would happen to your assets what would happen to your family and your children if something were to happen to you today based upon either having no plan in place because the state always has a plan for you or having just a basic, you know, four or five page will in place and, uh, and having to go to probate court. So, you know, we walk people through that process and then we uh, are able to tailor a, a specific plan for them that meets their needs based upon their family situation, based upon the assets that they have. So it's tailored to them to save them money, to keep their families out of court, to keep their families and their assets out of any sort of conflict so that when that time comes that they die, because everybody is going to die at some point in time, when that time comes, everything is as smooth as possible for those people that they leave behind. And this is not a cookie cutter form driven type of practice where you have a template for a will, you pull the former client's name out, you put the next client's name in, and basically everybody gets the same documents. That's not what we do. Um, that doesn't serve people. Um, it sends people to probate court, it costs people thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars, um, it exposes them to creditor claims, it exposes them to public scrutiny of their assets, people can pull their files, take a look at what their assets are. It's just a terrible process to end up in probate court, which is what these cookie cutter form wills do. 
um, we design plans specifically for individuals to keep them out of court, to keep them out of probate court, to keep them from having to spend the type of money that you end up having to spend, statutorily spend, uh, by going to probate court. Um, and again, to preserve their assets, to preserve this legacy for the people that they leave behind. Mm -hmm. So that's what we do for, you know, I would say 70% of our families out there protect their kids through guardianships, protect their assets. But then also we serve this older population, this growing older population um, who are staring down the barrel of long-term care and nursing home care and trying to preserve their assets from being exhausted when they enter a nursing home, a long-term care facility. And that's very real. Yeah. And so we are able to do um, to, to do specific planning for older people, for families of older people to, um, to protect their assets, maximize Medicaid benefits so that Medicaid is forced to pay for those long-term care costs, those nursing home costs, thus maximizing what you can preserve in your estate for your beneficiaries, for those people that you leave behind. When it comes down to it, we are all about saving people money, protecting their assets for the people that they leave behind. And normally that is your children and your grandchildren. Yeah. And, uh, and so that's, that's what this is all about. I've seen too many people lose everything that they have to long-term care. And, um, and you know, it's, it's sad when somebody has worked their whole life for, for something and Medicaid is sitting there saying, well, until you sell everything you have and spend every penny you have down to $2,000, we're not going to contribute a penny towards your long-term care. Wow. That's a great, and, that's uh, a great I'll feeling. You, it affects people worse that are in the $100,000, $200,000 worth of assets than people who are at a million dollars. It's those people that have like one hundred to three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars of their assets. They're the ones that go through their money fast and um, and lose everything that they've worked for. Very, very sad. Wow, that is sad. And you you hear about these stories all the time because people, one, they just don't understand how things work. Right. Um, they may have a neighbor that got a will done, and they thought, oh, I'll just get a will done too. And 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 it just doesn't cover all the dynamics because. One thing that I've learned, you know, from knowing you and, and working with you is that everybody, while there are similarities between families and, and, and situations, everybody's different in certain ways and how they want to leave their stuff behind and when and where and who and how all that happens. Um, it's, it's very, it needs to be thought through and nobody's, like you said, it's not cookie cutter. So briefly, Talk about the components that you often, you know, prepare uh, a an estate plan for. What what are the kinds of things that are in an estate plan? Okay, well, depending upon what the person has, you know, a last will and testament is always a part of an estate plan. Um, but a last will and testament is not necessarily the best document for an estate plan. Um, we also use what's called a revocable living trust. Now, this is not an irrevocable trust. Uh, this is a revocable trust, which is where you continue to own your property. You continue to have total control over your property. What is the difference between a revocable living yeah. trust and a last will and testament? A revocable living trust avoids probate court. So you don't go through that six month waiting period of probate court. You don't uh, end up with the cost and expense of probate court. Uh, it's not public like probate court is. It's, uh, it is a much more streamlined process. And so if somebody has, um, you know, uh, assets and belongings that uh, when we walk through the process of what would happen in probate court, if we can save them money by doing a revocable living trust, then that's what we encourage them to do. But only if we can save them money. Um, I can tell you that most of the people we meet with, yes, that is the, that is the situation that they need a revocable living trust. So we weigh the difference between a revocable living trust and a last will and testament 
um, you know, a revocable living trust, one last thing about it, it is a, it's basically a legal mechanism that we set up that takes title ownership over your assets. Huh. And, and the reason why that's important is because when you die, nothing happens to your assets. They just continue on in that trust. Uh, your beneficiaries then take the assets that are in that trust. But uh, you don't have to go to probate court because nothing ends at the time of your death. That trust, that legal instrument that you created continues on. Yep. Just like as if it were a corporation. It continues on. It doesn't end just because you die like your estate does. So you don't have to go to probate court. So we always do a living will um, and or a trust. And then we every plan that we do comes with what we call ancillary documents, okay? So a durable power of attorney. Everybody, everybody, no matter what kind of asset you have, everybody needs a durable power of attorney. So most people know what a power of attorney is. It's where you give somebody authority to act on your financial behalf. So it could be buying or selling property. It could be opening or closing checking accounts, borrowing money, lending money, um, negotiating stocks, bonds, uh, giving direction for IRAs, life insurance, um, investment decisions. And the reason it's called durable is because this power of attorney extends beyond it goes beyond the duration of your disability. So if you end up disabled, this goes beyond your disability. It extends beyond that time. So even when you're disabled, once you've given a durable power of attorney to somebody, they can continue operating under that power of attorney, even if you're disabled and incapacitated. Mm -hmm. And that's very important. Um, so a durable power of attorney is one of the documents. Now, our durable powers of attorney are springing. So what does that mean? It means that they don't go into effect immediately. So if, I, if I'm 53 years old and I sign a durable power of attorney to my 27-year-old son, he can't go out and cash out my checking account. <laughs> um, it, there are certain um, hoops that the person has to jump through in order to make that durable power of attorney spring into effect. Like certain um, conditions you that have, have to, get, to be met, right? You have to be right. You have to get for me. It's I need you're gonna, they're going to have to get two uh, cer uh, certifications from my treating physicians that I am incapacitated or disabled and cannot handle my affairs. For a lot of people, it's a spouse and a treating physician, mm. or a child and a treating physician. So um, you know, people put different conditions on their springing powers of attorney, their durable powers of attorney, but it it makes it safe. So you don't feel like you've just given away everything you have to somebody that they could go in and, and clean you out. No, that's not the way right. these are. We do healthcare powers of attorney and a healthcare power of attorney um, is from the time you become disabled or incapacitated up until close to the time of death. Who makes decisions? If you're incapacitated and you're unable to make decisions regarding your healthcare, who picks the doctor that's going to treat you? Who, were to pick, who would pick your uh, long-term care facility or nursing home if you had to go into one? Um, if you had to go uh, into rehabilitation or if hospice or hospice had to be considered, who makes those decisions? Well, people may say, I've got a living will, but a living will does not do that. A healthcare power of attorney allows somebody to make those decisions. A living will is incredibly important, and that is end-of-life decisions. Do you want to go on artificial life support or do you not want to go on artificial life support at the end of your life? Do you want artificial food and hydration or do you not want artificial food and hydration toward the end of life? Those are decisions that are made by a living will. Very basic, very end of life decisions. But between the time that you become incapacitated and the time that you are at those end of life decisions, there is a lot of decisions to be made in between. And if you're incapacitated or disabled, who's going to make those decisions for you? Well, you know, if somebody had to make those decisions and you did not have the right documentation in place, the right legal documents prepared, then they're going to have to go to guardianship court and be named your guardian. Or if you don't have a power of attorney in place, they're going to have to go be named the custodian over your assets. So you're trying to keep your family out of court. You're trying to keep your family from having to go spend a ton of money just to do what you could get done today hmm. for, I mean, not even a fraction of what it would cost them to go to disability court. 
all roads lead back to probate court. You know, that's, that's the court that handles all everybody's favorite. If you, if you don't have these documents in place, where do you go? Back to probate court, back to a stranger, a judge who's going to make these decisions. And the person that you want taking care of your person, being your guardian, if you're unable to handle your own, your own affairs, decisions over your body, the person who handles your money, the conservator, the guardian of your children, if you're unable to take care of them, the person the judge handles to do all of these things may not be the person you would want. So it's incredibly important to get these things in place early. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and that's just being responsible. It's being a good parent and it's being a good custodian over your own assets that you've worked hard yeah. for. Well, I think a key thing to, to remember here is, you know, what is life really all about? Why do we even work, right? Do we just work just because we like to work? No, we, most people work so they can live. They can live a certain quality of life and go places, do things, and, and, and just and enjoy all that the world has to offer. Travel, go to the yeah. beach with their families, create memories, and just, you know, live life to the fullest. Be happy. You know, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, all those fun things for which make America great. Um, that's really what it's all about. Is it? So, you know, people pour their hearts and their souls into a business. If they're a business owner, if, if they're, you know, another, uh, uh, you know, leader working for somebody in a business, you're putting blood, sweat, and tears into a career one way or the other. So you can have nice things or, or be able to do things that bring you joy and happiness in life and, and make the world a better place. And, and so what value I see that Sean brings to the table is going through things in a way. Um, so it, one, it, it, it allows you to think differently than what you normally think. It allows you to think about things you normally don't think about and goes through this process. It takes you through a series of scenarios or what, what if the, the, the husband dies and the wife lives and there's two kids? Well, what if the husband and the wife pass away, then they leave two kids? Well, what if the kid's 14? What if the kid's 22? There's all these different, you know, umpteen different scenarios and things that can play out that can change the dynamic for which your life and your legacy may unfold and where you've spent all this blood, sweat and tears in a business and in a career um, can, can, can completely go awry and go a different direction in ways you never ever would want intended. And all that work, all that effort you put into this life that you've created is all, you know, sometimes for nothing. And it right. gets, you know, squandered away or held up in the courts and, 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 you know, it, it's, it's very sad. There's a lot of sad stories. I know you come across them all the time, but I'm going to put myself in the, in the, you know, perspective of, the, of a viewer right now that may not understand all of this yet. Right. Okay. I, I kind of get where Sean's going with this, but my cousin can do, you know, he, he does, you know, he's like an intern in a law office and I can have them tee up a, a, a will. Uh, we, we can have something quick and easy. I can go on legal zoom and, and do this online thing and figure it all out. Do, do it yourself law. How is your process and how you do that and how you encapsulate all of these different things into a, an estate plan different and better and more beneficial than doing it the other way that I described? Well, I mean, it's it's the difference between night and day. I mean, if you want if you want to spend one hundred and fifty dollars to get a will done, somebody will do a will for you, it, or you can get it off of LegalZoom and you can be on your way. Um, there's nobody to ask questions to. There's nobody who's looking at your assets to determine the whether or not you're even doing the proper documentation, <laughs> um, because you have decided that you are the expert, and you're you, you know you're taking it upon yourself to to uh, draft these documents, it is, uh, it would be like um, trying to diagnose yourself uh, of a medical condition and trying to treat yourself, which would be foolish, right? Um, and, and, and so, yes, you can do that and you can pay $150 for it. Um, 
The difference between that and what we do is we are drafting a plan that is tailored specifically for you, for your assets, for your business situation, for the number of children you have, for their ages. Um, and we are, we have, uh, we will go through every scenario to help figure out, you know, if, if X, Y, Z happens in your life, um, is the outcome going to be okay for you? Uh, this is what the outcome will be. Is it okay for you? If not, we can fix it. And then we go through other scenarios and we walk through those with you and ask you, are these okay with you? Um, because if not, let's put something into place within this plan that we're working on uh, that will keep that from happening or that will make the situation better. You cannot do this um, when doing a fill in the blank uh, plan. And, and listen, that's probable, that's, that's what half the lawyers out there are doing. Um, they're doing fill in the blank plans. Um, just like LegalZoom is doing a fill in the blank plan. You cannot get a tailored plan um, by doing something like that. You have to be able to sit down with somebody that knows all of your assets, that knows all of your property, your, your children, um, the dynamics of your family. They've got to know that before preparing a plan for you. If an attorney or some website does not ask you, you know, what is your asset situation? Um, do you have investments? Do you have checking accounts? Do you have cars? Do you have real property? Um, do you have children? If so, how old are they? Do you have an ex-spouse? Is this a first marriage or a second marriage? Yeah. Without going through all of this, nobody can draft a good plan for you. Yeah. Um, so you can't tell that to a computer. And you sure can't tell it to somebody that you meet with for 15 minutes. It's impossible. Right. It is absolutely impossible to know um, how your assets are going to end up um, when you die uh, without somebody knowing what your situation is. It's just impossible yeah. to do. So uh, we take the time. I mean, you know, Jason, our, we have a family wealth planning, planning session. That's our first appointment that we have for our clients. And we set aside two hours for these meetings with our new clients. And we literally walk through everything and the scenarios that can happen. And our clients sit there wide-eyed because they've never thought of this before. And it happens every time that somebody says, I never thought of that. Um, I never thought of that. <laughs> and so, and that's our job. Our job is to think of that. Our job is to walk through these scenarios and to say, if this happened, would that be okay? Does that work for you? Um, and if not, how can we make it better? And I can tell you this, you know, people think, well, this has to cost a lot more. It really doesn't. And in the whole scheme of things, when you look at what it costs to go to probate court down the road, we are a fraction, a fraction of yeah. the cost. And when you're talking about long-term care planning, planning for nursing homes, saving your parents' assets, so that they can pass them down when something happens to them, or if you're the person that's looking at paying those costs right now, you know, trying to preserve your assets for your beneficiaries, we are less than the cost of one month in the nursing home. Wow. To protect years worth of nursing home costs. Um, and so, you know, it's in the whole scheme of things, it is a drop in the bucket what you pay to get a good plan in place. Because Sure, you can pay a couple hundred bucks to have a will done, but if you end up paying ten thousand dollars in in probate fees, what good was that? You're way ahead now. You yeah. know, yeah. And and, you're, and that's where you're going to go if you do a will, you end up in probate court. Yeah. So, uh, you, at least at least if you're going to end up with a will, know that it is the right tool for you. Know what's going to happen. Walk through it with somebody who can go through all of your assets and say, this is what happens to everything you have going through probate court. This is what happens with everything you have through some sort of alternative method of, of, of planning. And for gosh sakes, 
for gosh sakes, don't do it yourself without a plan and try to beat the system. You know, a lot of people think, oh, I'll just put my kid's name on my house or I'll just do all payable on death uh, designations on my accounts. And that way I don't even need to do a will. I don't, nothing will go through probate court and it all just goes to my beneficiaries. That is the worst thing you can do. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that, but the number one reason is what? You don't get a step up in basis for your kids when you die. So, you know, you buy a bunch of assets, you know, you buy some stock and you've got it for 10, 20 years. You buy a home and you pay $100,000 for it and it's worth 200000 or more when you die. Well, if you if you try to beat the system and add people's names huh. to these to these uh, these investments and, and they go straight to your kids, well, guess what? Because you did that, they don't get a step up in basis and they're going to get hit with capital gains taxes when they die. These are the huh. things that we think about that that other attorneys uh, you know, just don't think about. And quite frankly, financial planners don't think about it either. They're, a, a lot of financial planners are really big on payable on death, designations on, um, but, uh, but, you know, play that out. What happens if you've got a 13-year-old son and you do a payable on death to your spouse if you have one? If you don't have a spouse, you, you leave everything to your child because it'll bypass probate that way, everything goes to your child. Well, it sounds great, but what happens if you die and your child's 15 years old? Well, first of all, if you're divorced, your ex-spouse is going to become the conservator of their funds. So, because that's the child's parent and that's just going to happen because you didn't do a plan that named a guardian or conservator of their funds. <laughs> so that's number one. Uh, all of their funds that you left them, your retirement accounts, your life insurance, everything that you could do payable on death is going to go to your ex-spouse to uh, watch over until your child turns 18. And then when your child turns 18, whether they're in high school or out of high school, it doesn't matter. They're going to get a big check on their 18th birthday because you cannot keep those assets when it's payable on death or by beneficiary designation. You cannot keep those assets held back from them uh, from the time they have 18 on. So mm -hmm. If you want to protect your children, if you want to protect their assets, if you want to name who the guardian of their assets would be, if you want to protect them and, you know, restrict how their money is spent until they're old enough and responsible enough to be able to spend that money on their own, you can't do it by a will and you sure as heck can't do it by a beneficiary designation. So, um, you know, all of this stuff is things that we do uh, and it's those extra steps that we take so that, like I said before, you can go through life knowing it doesn't matter what happens. Everybody that I love, everything that I have is protected. Um, and, and you know exactly what's going to happen to your assets. It's not that you took a, uh, you know, a shot in the dark, filled out something online, wasted a couple hundred dollars when you could have paid a little bit more than that, but had a perfect plan in place for you and your family. Yeah. Wow, that, that you really packed that together, and I I think people can clearly see and start understanding. You know, this is complicated. You know that life is complicated when you start thinking about all of these things that we're talking about. It it just gets complicated. Scenario A, scenario B, and how do you account for all these different things? you can't do that on your own. You don't even know what you don't even know. And unless you're, you're you know, some kind of an expert, which 99.9% .9 of the people in the world are not, unless they're really specifically trained and in this discipline of law, you're setting yourself up for failure. So it's complicated. Get a custom plan specifically designed and wrapped around you, your family, that no matter what happens and what 15,000 scenarios could play out in your life, that the things that need to happen will happen the way you want them to happen that's in the best interest of everybody involved. And, and lastly, right. from my perspective, is connect with an expert that really, truly understands this. Somebody like Sean that that's special. He doesn't do 15 types of law. One day he's 
prosecuting a DUI and other days doing an estate plan and other days doing a will and other days, you know, brokering a, a, a negotiation of a divorce settlement, right? What is interesting about you is you are very specifically focused and the expert, you know, you are the expert you know, on estate planning. And that's something that you have to, and I would say this to anybody who's looking for any lawyer, you know, Kentucky does not certify specialty of law. So any lawyer can say, I am a, today I'm going to be a bankruptcy lawyer. Uh, tomorrow I'm a criminal lawyer. The next day, that would be like, you know, your neurosurgeon standing up and saying, today I'm a foot doctor. Tomorrow I'm a brain surgeon. The next day I'm going to be a urologist. And then I'm a pediatrician the day after that. We think, well, that would be ridiculous. Well, that's because the medical specialty is, you know, they certify special yeah. specialization specialties of, of medicine. But the law does not. So you have to look to see who has taken that time to focus on on these areas of law. And like I said before, you know, um, I made a very intentional uh, decision to focus on this uh, many years ago. And, and so, you know, people who are continuing uh, their legal education, uh, who go to seminars on, on this subject, who deal with this every day, um, that's what you need to know. Um, you know, I, I don't hold myself out as a divorce lawyer. I don't hold myself out as a criminal lawyer or a, uh, an expert in UCC or real estate transactions. It's not what I do. Um, so when you, if you contact somebody, you know, don't, I'm just, this would be my advice, you know, ask them if this is, is if this is what they focus on, is this what they concentrate in? Um, and you know, if somebody says, Hey, my friend does real estate closings, he'll do a will for you. <laughs> Probably not the person you want to go to. Right. Um, you know, I mean, not, I mean, I've got a lot of friends who do real estate and they send, they send their people to me. <laughs> so, you know, um, and, and I send people who need real estate closings to right. them because it would be, uh, irresponsible of me to, to try and handle those. So, you know, just ask questions if you talk to somebody and for gosh sakes, um, don't, make sure you you're able to talk with people at length about yourself and your family and your assets before creating a plan. Um, it's just too important to risk on a cookie cutter fill in the blank thing that you get online. It just is. It's not worth it. And you're putting your children at risk. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's really great advice, Sean. And, and uh, you know, at the end of the day, if you needed brain surgery, you wouldn't just go to any general surgeon that, that does basic general surgery stuff. You want to go to a specific brain surgeon, somebody that's actually done it like a thousand or more times, right? Not, it's not, it's not their third time out of medical school and, you know, it's their, you know, or somebody that just does it, you know, once a year yeah, exactly, or whatever their friends right? send somebody over You, there. you would yeah. not feel comfortable having somebody do brain surgery in those kind of situations. You want somebody that's very seasoned, very experienced, that's done a lot of those, that gives you the degree of confidence you need that, that it's going to be done. It's going to be done right because you're, you're seasoned in that discipline. And so I'll kind of, as we kind of close up the show here, you know, Sean, I'll give, I'll give, uh, the audience kind of a little personal testimony. A couple things with me. Uh, this this has been an interesting year for me personally. One, my my own mother um, went through. Uh, you know, she got sick and she over the course of a few months went downhill and ultimately died and passed away back in April. And you know, she did not. She did not have an estate plan. She had a will, she had a power of attorney and, and, and a medical, uh, I think, power of attorney. She had some the basic things that a lot, lot, lot of people do have, which were good. Those were helpful in this process because there was a point where she went downhill and we had to start making medical decisions and, and other estate-related decisions on her behalf. She had pets and all kind of stuff to deal with. And, you know, it just got complicated really, really fast. It's an emotional 
roller coaster to see your loved ones go through you know uh, these types of things and and then you're stuck in the situation you're forced to make decisions you don't have a lot of time to to figure it out on the fly right this is why planning and talking to experts like Sean is critical up front and having a plan so when it happens you have a playbook for which you can execute and everybody's all on the same page versus an event happening and then you're reactive to it and having to figure it out on the fly when you're not even educated or knowledgeable as much as you need to and you know you're you're making emotional decisions too during this kind of a thing so I went through that with with my family recently uh, earlier in the year and and you know Sean you were just amazing you helped kind of guide me navigate me and my family through these things and thank the Lord you know all of that worked out and and um, uh, you know we were able to, to you know dissolve her estate and do things in the way in which she would want that done and preserve her yeah. her legacy and her intentions but then that got me thinking about my life and I come to realize here's what I realized you know because I was in the military and on the way out of the door literally you know within hours of me getting on a plane and, and going to Iraq in 2003 the JAG officer the, the 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 legal officer on duty that day says hey do you have a will and I'm like uh, I'm pretty newly married and I've got a kid coming and I've you know we've got all these uh, no well we need to get you an emergency will let's and, and it was this cookie cutter off the shelf thing they took somebody else's name out of it put my name in it and it covered a few basic things you know you know thank the Lord that the military does those things for their troops um, is a supporting mechanism, you know, because you just don't know. A military is a dangerous business. You may or may not come home from a mission, right? And so I had that will for, you know, over 20 years. Never updated it, never looked at it, never changed. And my dynamics, you know, I, I was in the military, out of the military, in different businesses, opened another business. My wife moved around. Our kids have evolved, and now they're ones in college, ones in high school. Our situation is completely different, and that will is basically null and void. It was written in a whole other state that doesn't even apply to the state that I live in, which is the the Commonwealth of Kentucky. So we were, you know, we were just busy in life, got caught up with things, just didn't even think about this stuff, and then. Sure. A significant emotional event happened with my family, with my mom, and it just caused me to kind of take a step back and say, okay, what the heck's going on here? This was not a fun process. There's got to be a better way. And luckily, I, I had known you and, and we were friends and, and I said, Sean, let's, let's talk about this. Went in your office and I will tell you, I, I went into it knowing a few things but i came out of it knowing a whole heck of a lot more than i ever even thought i would even need to know and sean your process was really really great you take people through this in a very nice easy comfortable simplistic way one thing that i loved about that experience and why i decided to you know have you do this for me and my family was you you simplified it right this legal stuff is complicated to people it hurts people's brains to even think through all this stuff but you did it in such a fun and 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 you know uh, appropriate way and just guided us through that there were times where we didn't me and my wife didn't know to go left or go right or what what to do and you you just helped navigate and made it really really easy to where now we have a fully comprehensive um, estate plan that captures all of the things we need to capture. One of the things that really stood out to me, there was a, a scenario that you laid out that happened in your life where your child was off to college, got hurt, went to the hospital yes. to be treated, and you couldn't, because she was over 18 and HIPAA laws and rules, you couldn't even talk to the doctors about your daughter to even see if she was okay and what room she was in and how to even connect up and figure things out 
with with your family and I'm like, oh my God, my daughter's 19 and she's at college and what if have something happened to her? I, we can't we can't figure out anything. And so you helped us with those things. And so one, just thank you so much for, for what you do. It's critically important for people in their lives. They, like I said earlier, people work their entire lives building a business, building a career, climbing the corporate ladder, uh, making investments, buying properties, putting their kids through school, all to live this wonderful, awesome life to which can be completely squandered away. When I went through this process with you, you had mapped it out. If I didn't have an estate plan, I just had a basic will or a base, few basic things and something happened to me, it would have cost me, I think it was in the order of magnitude of about sixty to $70,000 just in probate alone. And the math was just so starkly obvious. I'm like, this, this is ridiculous. So one, thank you for what you do. I think you're doing an amazing job of helping a lot of people in a tough, in, a, in some tough situations and preventing yeah. tough situations. And so folks, if you're out there and you're, you know, working your butt off and, and putting a lot of effort and blood and sweat and tears into your career, into your business, into the things that surround your professional life, uh, to in an effort to build and maintain a wonderful family life that you want to live to the fullest, you need to think about these things. This is kind of the, the capstone of things you need to consider and wrap around your business, wrap around your career, wrap around your loved ones in order to protect them and ensure that all the things you work for wasn't for nothing at the end of the day when the legal system kicks in, when you can't even speak for yourself um, towards the end of your life uh, if, in the event that if something unfortunate happens to you. So, Sean, thank you so much for being on the show. Do you have any 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 final comments you want to leave for our uh, wonderful audience out there? No, I think you touched on it. You know, it, it, that, you know, I think on I think at my I think about my life, um, just like you said, you know, I've got four children. Um, everything I do, uh, I think about them. My mom had four children as well. She had four boys. And she used to tell me all the time, she died when she was, she died when she was 69 years old. And, uh, but she used to always say, I always count up what I have and I divide it by four and I think about what I'm going to leave my children, you know, and that's how important that is. Um, that's how important it is to a lot of people. You know, what can I pass on? What can I leave? Um, you know, some people that I represent are leaving just and it doesn't take, it's not like these people are millionaires. It doesn't take that. I mean, but, but you've got people who are preserving their assets to put, you know, kids or grandkids through school. It, you can touch people's lives through appropriate planning. You can make your assets live on and touch people's lives for generations. And um, it's just something very special. And instead of fighting, you know, instead of going to, court all the time and fighting with other lawyers and taking depositions and stuff like that. Like you said, I'm helping to just make things better for people and, uh, and prevent bad things from happening. So, you know, it's, it's worth coming in. It's worth, you know, checking us out. I think, uh, just to go through what you've got in place to see if, if it makes sense to you and just do a free planning session with us. Yeah. And, and knowledge is power and 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 it gives yeah, you the ability absolutely. to to make really good decisions that are in the best interest of you and, and your loved ones and so you definitely do that and and in the first session to kind of walk through that and figure out what a plan could be for you is complimentary you do that just just to help people and if they decide to move forward that's great if if they don't then that's that's, that's great too and that's so right. Uh, Sean, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for just being Absolutely. a really good person in the world and and really simplifying all this legal stuff and, and really thinking about things that nobody else thinks about in a way that, that can really make a positive difference and impact on them and in the world that we all leave behind, which I think is what life is really all about. 
And so if you want to learn more about Sean Lohman and Lohman Law, please take time to visit his website at LohmanLaw.com. There you'll find all kinds of you know, tools, resources, uh, case studies, and just different you know, information uh, that, that can help kind of, you know, kind of figure, start the process of, of understanding what this is and how it can benefit you. Um, and, fr and Sean does these complimentary comments. So you can book all that right online on his website. He's got a great website. And as always, um, you know, if you are looking to, to, you know, make changes get in a business, get out of a business, and, and do some of the things that we've talked about here today, and you want to learn more about how to set your business and career up for success and allow guys like, you know, Sean to help you, feel free to reach out to our website as well at SoarHireCoaching.com. There's a ton of free resources and informational things out there to help you kind of from, from the business and career perspective and how that it, it impacts uh, the things that Sean uh, talked about today. So great show. Thank you so much. Uh, I think, you know, the audience really got a lot of value from that today. And thanks for your time today, Sean. Well, thank you for having me. Yes. Yeah, we, we love it and, and look forward to maybe having you back again and, and talking about some okay. things uh, to help people as well. So we'll, uh, we'll call it a, a wrap for today and look forward to seeing you next week on the next show. Have a good day.